Hi, welcome to the bathtub. This is Scott Bradfield. I just had to, to erase the last version of this because my crazy dog was in here and we weren't doing puppy noir, so she was running around the goddamn room with a monkey just shaking the life out of this thing. And I was trying to talk about these difficult stuff and I just I lost my temper and I yelled at the poor dog and I I had to, I don't go apologize and take her outside and put her give her a toy. And hopefully she'll leave us alone for a few minutes. Okay. So uh, the game plan today is uh, we're going to do our, our decreasingly popular, decrease or increasingly unpopular series called Yay and Nay, or Nay and Yay. And the game plan is simply we're going to try to take a book, uh, somebody or a writer or a book that maybe is, I think, too popular and maybe realize, or maybe discuss a book that you may not have read, which should be popular. And that's, that's the gimmick of this pointless series of talks. This one is called uh, Thomas Pynchon's The Crying of Lot 49. Nay, you can live your life. You don't need to read it. You'll be f perfectly happy. You'll have, you'll have a really nice life. You never have to read this book. Uh, you don't have to read Gravity's Rainbow. Inherent Vice, his late 2008-2009 novel, was made into a movie which I've avoided. I'm sure it's good, but I just don't want to see it. Uh, one of my all-time favorite pieces of American prose, just incredible piece of writing. Inherent Vice, beautiful book. You really need to read this, not this. So that's the game plan. Okay, I I have a a, a basic uh, disaffection for most of the early pension. I find it really overly clever, overly uh, tied up, and overly worked out. And this is a good book to talk about in that in that context. A Crying Lot Forty Nine is his second novel, sort of a short. It's kind of a long story, and uh, many people read this book for the same reason I often taught it in modern literature courses, because it was the shortest of the early pension, and most people could read it without going too crazy. I've never made it through Gravity's Rainbow. I, I, I will try it again, um, and I want to talk a few things about why I, do, I don't like this book, and then we can spend a second talk, I'll do a second talk on why I think Inherent Vice is a work of beauty and genius and just great pleasure. You just have nothing but fun and laugh your head off at that book. Okay, so I reread this. I, I followed our game plan. I'm having my, uh, I really need my martini this time because the dog drove me crazy in the last uh, version. My floral pattern martini glass, just like uh, Philip Marlowe uses. He drinks that in the big sleep. He's using a floral pa pattern martini glass. And I'm going to do a couple talks. This is uh, Six, 60s, mid 60s, uh, short novel, and it's called, the character's named uh, Edipa Moss, and it works really well. I often think of this as a sequel to, to Crying Lot 49 because they're both very unusual for various reasons. One is they both have one point of view throughout the entire book. Most of Pinch's novels, especially his early ones like V and Gravity's Rainbow, his late ones like Against the Day, Many, many characters, many, many points of view, which he juggles very pretty adroitly in the later books. And he rarely does the single point of view, which I think is the real test of a good writer. And he does uh, Edipa Moss in this one and Doc Sportello, who's the PI, the private investigator in Inherent Vice. And he does it in this incredibly well. And in this, she's not really a strong central personality. She's more like a kind of a... a, a a camera that's going through this world that Pynchon wants to explore. They're also both detective novels. So Doc Sportello is trying to find the connections between all these disparate weird characters in Southern California, and Edipa Moss is doing the same while she investigates the uh, uh, the death, the, 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 the estate that's left behind by her old boyfriend, who's a wealthy older man. Okay. So, but her personality is much less interesting. She's kind of far way back. She's trying to put together and make connections between all the things happening in her world. And so there's very great deal of similarities. There's also lots of surf rock music running through both these books. Um, now, unlike the later one, though, this is a much more worked out and kind of overly clever book. I find it, reading in the bathtub this past few weeks or about a week ago, First of all, I enjoyed it more than I did when I was teaching it. So there were parts of it really made me laugh, parts of it are quite funny. Uh, it's an interesting book. It doesn't work. It's most of the set pieces. There's a series of set pieces in the book which go on too long. Most of them do. And I get the, this feeling from Gravity's Rainbow. For example, you have a long opening scene about 10 pages in 
where Oedipa meets a man in a hot in a motel, and they're they're and they're playing some game where um, she, they're going to take their clothes off during this game. Every time each one of them asks the other person a question, I think. And, and it's like strip poker, strip interrogation. And the joke is Oedipa puts on tons of clothes. Okay. And that's kind of a metaphor for the whole book, which is where every time you take something off, every time you take a layer off the onion, you think you're getting closer and you're not. You just keep getting further away from the truth. Okay, so this it's clever. Right? Um, but during the course of this seduction where these two are making out in this hotel, this motel, um, it turns out that the man used to be a child actor. It's a very funny idea. He was a child actor like like Shirley Temple, and I forget his name now. But they're watching on the TV. There's a movie, an old movie starring this guy as a kid actor. And of course, kid actors are always happy endings, and it turns out well. So during the course of this seduction, this TV show is going on, and you're expecting Oedipus expecting the little boy in the, in the in the TV movie to have a happy everything turns out well. And the kid, just everything gets worse and worse. Everyone's dying, and it's a horrible thing on television. And it's the sort of thing you'd never see on TV. And so you have this long set piece. It's, it goes on for like 10 pages. And it's very funny for a few minutes, but it just goes on too long. There's a number of, uh, basically the book is about Oedipa, Oedipa Ma. So there's a, there's a, Joke on Freudianism all through it. Oedipa, without the puss at the end, without the penis. Uh, she needs more moss. Her husband's name is Mucho Moss. You need much more. So the joke of penis envy, and she wants to get to the truth. And as she's trying to unravel the truth by investigating this older man's connections in the world, she gets further and further away. Okay, perfectly a good idea. It just goes on too, for too long. In the course of investigating this estate, she finds all sorts of things, an alternate postal system, um, a group of a, sort of a, 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 a group of fake Native American Indians who are actually masquerading as real Indians so that they could fight, uh, I think, West Wells Fargo or something. There's a long, it starts off funny, takeoff on the Revengers tragedies. Revengers tragedies where you have two warring families like Romeo and Juliet is a spin-off on the Revengers tragedies. And it goes on about 10 or 15 pages where she watches this Revengers tragedy and this this group called the Tristero System, who are the dark, shadowy people who work, lurk in the shadows, who are kind of this unconscious force that's constantly welling up in the world around Oedipa and kind of taking things over. And one of the jokes that occurs uh, somewhere well into the book is Oedipus says something like, you know, we believe in Freudianism that by examining and exploring our dark side, we can bring it out to the light, but we can't. It takes us down. It's always going to win. And so the Tristero system, which has an alternate postal system, which is used by a group of, uh, there's, a, there's a certain post horn with a mute in it, which is a sign of it, etc. I don't want to go on too far about it. Um, if you read it, you will, you may enjoy parts of it. It's the sort of book that you can actually parse in a kind of clinical. You can, you can read it as a deconstruction. You can read it as a Marxist text. But if you read it properly, I think, you probably laugh and have a good time in parts. I found it very boring in parts. I still find it very difficult in parts just to get through some of these scenes. And it basically continually leads us through a examination that, that Oedipa takes into this culture around her that never really reaches the truth. That's the joke. Um, okay, I, won't, I don't want to spend much more time on that. I will say this. I lost all my post-its because my crazy dog. I just want to read a passage. because I want to read a passage from Inherent Vice on the next one. There's something about the prose in Early Pynchon that drives me crazy. There'll be great, funny passages. But there's something overly worked out, just like that story I just told you. Overly worked out, too clever, too clever by half, and overly complicated. Naughty. I think of knots. There's just lots of knots in all the prose. And I'll just read a quick passage to give you some example of what I feel I hit almost every other paragraph in the first three Pynchon books, especially Gravity's Rainbow. This is page 92. One of the gimmicks that she's coming through is she's there's a idea that Oedipus starts to wonder is, which is, am I seeing the truth? Am I actually examining the world and learning things? 
or am I simply projecting my belief system on the world? And that's an opposition that keeps recurring throughout the book as we meet lots of different characters and hear lots of different stories about these alternate histories. Okay, and here's just an example of pair of the prose. 92. Last night, she might have wondered what undergrounds apart from the couple she knew of communicated by way system. Those are the kind of fucking sentences. I'm sorry, they just... You, you have to reread it three or four times just to know what the hell's happening in that sentence. Last night, she might have wondered what undergrounds apart from the couple she knew of communicated by waste system. By sunrise, she could legitimately ask what undergrounds didn't. Now, there's a, comp a contrasting thought that in late, no in late Pynchon novels, he just delivers bang beautifully quickly. And this is just all tangled up in itself. If miracles were, as Jesus Arabal had postulated years ago on the beach at Mazatlan, intrusions into this world from another, a kiss of cosmic pool balls, then so must be each of the night's post horns. Now, you start to hear these little glimmers of the really good late pigeon prose and then these awkward concluding phrases. The kiss of the cosmic pool balls is nice. Then so must be each of the night's post horns. She's been seeing a series of these post horns. And, uh, for here were God knew how many citizens deliberately choosing not to communicate by U.S. mail. It was not an act of treason or possibly even of defiance, but it was a calculated withdrawal from the life of the Republic from its machinery. And that's where those, those sentences are making sense. There's this machinery of culture, and all these people who don't feel satisfied by it are trying to get away from it. And that's what she's investigating. Whatever else was being denied them out of hate, indifference to the power of their vote, loopholes, simple ignorance, this withdrawal was their own unpublicized private. And you really got to read those sentences over and over again. And I really find large sections of Pynchon's prose like this in the early books. Since they could not have withdrawn into a vacuum, could they? There had to exist the separate, silent, unsuspected world that closes a little more clearly. Okay, I don't want to go on belabor this too much, but that's a good example. Those passages recur throughout the book for me. And every time I read it, almost every other paragraph, I hit one of those paragraphs, and I have so much trouble getting through some of those sentences that I just lose track of what's happening. Um, we're going to go on to a book where that never happens. There's not a single sentence like that in, in Inherent Vice or in any of the late pigeon that I can find. It, it's a great piece of writing, and we'll talk about that next. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm not bringing Lucky back in, but I'm going to go make sure she's okay. All right, bye.